as we've been thinking and planning about Christmas with our family this year, we've been talking a lot about what we're going to do and how we're going to celebrate Christmas as a family. And a few days ago, my wife sent me a post on Facebook. How many of you know that, that in, your, in your deepest, darkest moments, Facebook can speak to you? Amen? Facebook can guide your life and it can really help illuminate the way. And so my wife found this article on Facebook and I think there's a picture of it right there. And that's what it said. Confirmed. People who spend money on experiences instead of things are happier. Apparently, some of the universities have too much money, and so they spend that money on like studying crazy things that don't really matter, like whether you should buy a new iPhone or go on a trip. Which is going to make you happier? There's actually a psychology department in a university studying that. And this is what they said. The pursuit and purchase of physical possessions will never fully satisfy our desire for happiness. I'm thinking Matthew 6.33. Like, Jesus already said this stuff, right? We don't really need to study this. We just need to read our Bibles. And this is what they discovered. It may result in temporary happiness. Like that iPhone 4S made me so happy four years ago. And then this year I had enough of it. I'm like, i got to get rid of this phone. It's junk. This is garbage. Just a few years earlier, I was so excited about this technology and how powerful it was. And earlier this year, I was like, this thing is a boat anchor. It's horrible. It's archaic. It's so far behind the times. I've got to get a new iPhone. So I have an iPhone 6, which makes me very happy. But this is what they said. It may result in temporary fulfillment. But the happiness found in buying a new item rarely lasts. It's important to remember the value of, invest, of investing in once-in-a-lifetime experiences. I know there's an idea. Precious memories with our loved ones rather than indulging on the next hot item. For as they say, money cannot buy happiness. And here he is, Dr. Thomas Gilovich, who apparently has devoted the last couple years of his life to studying this. He's a psychology professor at Cornell University studying the link between money and happiness, and this is what Dr. Thomas Gilovich says. Our experiences are a bigger part of ourselves than our material goods. You can really like your material stuff. I like my stuff. How much stuff is there? How much stuff do you need? I don't know. How much is there? One of my favorite quotes from Veggie Tales. How much stuff do you need? I don't know. How much stuff is there? You can even think that part of your identity is connected to those things, like the car you drive, or the computer that you own, or the latest Apple product, or that very nice, uh, whatever. Anyways, the name of the designer went out of my head. Probably doesn't matter. You can even think part of your identity is connected to those things, but nonetheless, they remain separate from you. In contrast, your experiences really are part of you. We are the sum total of our experiences. So Ray and I went to Kelowna a couple days, last couple days, and instead of buying presents for our kids, we bought experiences. You are getting experiences for Christmas. There's a big hint. They're going, what? What are we going to experience? You'll just have to wait and see experiences instead of things. The Christmas tree will be rather sparse, but there are experiences coming. You know, there are some things in life that you just have to experience to understand. There are some things you can talk about, you can hear about, you can tell someone else about it, but until they experience it, they won't really know what you're talking about, right? Have you ever been telling somebody a story that you think is really cool, and they're kind of drawing this blank face? And you're like going on and on about what happened and they're like, and finally you say, I guess you had to be there. Why? Because you had to experience it to understand it. And there's some things in life you just have to experience. Hearing them is not enough. Now if I describe to you for a moment laughing from just a purely physiological standpoint, you'd think people were nuts to ever want to laugh. I mean, think about laughing. Your stomach tightens up. You lose control of your breathing. Your eyes begin to water. You can't talk. If you laugh really hard, your eyes start to bulge out. You lose control. No matter what people say, you can't stop it. 
You laugh so hard that you cry. It begins to hurt in your abdomen and you get cramps. Sometimes you fall over. And then you keep on laughing until you stop breathing. How is this possibly fun? You just have to experience laughing to understand it. So I've got a little video that I'm going to play for you right now. Here are some people Now, if you had no idea what laughing was and you saw someone like that last woman there, you'd be thinking like, what on the earth is going on? But when you have laughed, you know how fun it is, right? You have to experience some things to really understand them. Years ago, we took our kids to Mexico. Do you guys remember that trip to Mexico? It was so much fun. I can tell you all about that trip. I can tell you about the food. I can tell you about the water and the beach. But until you go there, you wouldn't really know what it was like. You'd only be kind of hearing it from me. The best part of that trip had to be the sunsets. Do you guys remember the sunsets every night? They were immersive. They were incredible. They went from one side of the sky to the other. And in fact, we started setting our watch during the day so that we would get back to our condo so we could get up to the eighth floor and sit on the deck facing west over the ocean and see the sunset. Now I brought a, I got a couple pictures of those sunsets for you, and they're pretty spectacular. But I can tell you, standing here looking at those pictures, they do not do justice to what we experienced when we were there. It was awe-inspiring. It was incredibly glorious. You couldn't even imagine it. You just sat there with your mouth gaping open for like 20 or 30 minutes going, as it just changed and changed and changed. It was incredible. Nothing compared to it. My advice this morning is go to Mexico. Just go to Mexico. You have to experience it to understand it. And you know, it's kind of like that with God. We can talk about God to people. We can talk about our faith in Christ to people. But until somebody experiences Him in their own life, they don't really know what we're talking about. When we share Christ with people, I think a lot of times we're telling them about Jesus and how wonderful He is and all they hear is waka, 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 waka. It just goes right past them. They really don't understand. You have to experience Him for yourself. So this morning, we're going to talk about experiencing Jesus and who He is. And I want to start by just reading what some of the writers in the Bible have had to say about who this incredible person is. And we're going to start with Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. This is one of the greatest passages in Scripture really telling us who Christ is. Listen to this. Christ, the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created. He's supreme over all creation. For through Him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He made the things we can see and the things that we can't see. Such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen realm. Everything was created through Him and for Him. He existed before anything else. Wow. He holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is His body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So He is first in everything. For God, in all His fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through Him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything 
in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Just imagine that. He existed before anything else. He holds all creation together. God created all things through Him and the fullness of God dwells in Him. Think about the vastness of the universe. The science, scientists try to estimate the age of the universe at billions and billions of years. And I don't know if they're right or they're wrong, but I'll tell you this. Jesus existed before it all began. He was there. He transcends the universe. Think about the massive scale of the universe. It's incredibly huge. We can't even conceive how big the universe is. And He holds it right here. And He just kind of looks at it. Well, there's a galaxy, 500 million stars. There's another galaxy over there, 100 million stars. There's another galaxy, and he knows them all. And he holds it in his hand. And the Bible says that all of God's fullness, a God who could conceive and architect and create a universe, a God who could set it physically and forcefully into motion, that God dwells in this human body, in this person, Jesus Christ. How is that even possible? It's kind of like trying to describe a, Mex a sunset in Mexico to a blind person. They're just not going to understand. They don't know what orange is. They don't know what red is. We really don't understand how could all the fullness of God live in Christ? How could that be? How could we ever possibly hope to experience who He is? Is it even possible for us to experience who He is? That should be our goal. Of all the things that we want to experience in this life, every, every experience that we go to, whether we climb on a plane and go to Mexico, or whether we enjoy the beaches of Hawaii, or whether we climb the Andes Mountains, or whether we go to Africa and, and enjoy the smiles of the children there, every experience that we can possibly imagine was created by Him. And everywhere we go that we experience these things, we're actually experiencing His creativity and His handiwork. We're seeing the evidence of His greatness. He's all around us. Of, the, of all the people in the Bible, I think who understood who Jesus was, there are two who I, I think experienced Him most completely. One was the Apostle Paul, and we just read what he wrote. Incredible words. 2,000 years after those words are written, we're still trying to understand all that Paul said. And the interesting thing is as science advances, what Paul said just makes more sense. It just kind of starts to all come together. And the other, of course, is John. John was the youngest of the disciples. Maybe a little older than Oakley. Probably got wired on tea like Oakley does. He was more, uh, more. Uh, what do you call that? Yeah, John was more. Um, he liked to hug and be, you know, affectionate. He was more affectionate. Yes, he was. Probably not as smart as Oakley, but more affectionate. I'm just kidding. The Apostle John, just a young boy traveling with Jesus, but we know that he had one of the greatest revelations of Jesus later on in his life, and all through his life. John experienced Jesus from his teenage years right to his old age. And he had an incredible revelation of who Jesus was. And this is what John opens his Gospel saying about Jesus. He says, In the beginning, before time began, before the cosmos sprung into being, before the universe and all that exists began, in the beginning, the Word already existed. John, what are you talking about? What do you mean the Word already existed and the Word was with God and the Word was God? That's how John introduced us to Jesus. The Bible says, and, and that the people that John wrote this to would understand that the beginning of creation goes like this. 
that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was, was without form and void and God spoke into the darkness. They would understand that. They would read this and automatically when John says in the beginning was the Word, they're thinking of the Word of God speaking forth and declaring creation. And then he goes on to say, but, but it wasn't just that the Word existed. The Word was with God. Not just did the Word come out and issue forth from God, but the Word was God. The very essence and nature of God was in His Word. And then suddenly John turns that all on its head and he personifies it and says, He existed in the beginning. John, what are you talking about? John as a teenage boy, walked with Jesus. He put his head on Jesus' bosom and felt the loving compassion of his Savior right there. He understood who Jesus was, the Creator, the Sustainer of all things. This powerful, incredible person was God Himself. And John walked with Him. And he ate with Him. And he says he existed in the beginning with God. And God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. And the word, this person, Jesus, this, this boy who grew up to become a man who put his arms out on a cross and died and came back to life and went to heaven, this person, he gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought life. Light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Don't you ever worry about the future of the church. It doesn't matter what the universities say or the educators say or the philosophers say or the politicians say or the media. It doesn't matter what any of them say. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. So the Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. When the fullness of God fills a man and takes shape and form of a man, what do we see? Unfailing love and faithfulness. You may be unfaithful, you may be unloving, uh, lovely, but He is faithful. And He is unfailing love. And we've seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. And no one has ever seen God, but the unique One, that's Jesus, who is Himself God, is near to the Father's heart, and He has revealed God to us. The disciples experienced Jesus firsthand. They walked with the One who holds the universe in His palm. They heard His words physically in their ears. They saw Him do the miracles. They didn't just know about Him. They didn't just hear the report that somebody came back and told them about their experience. They were there. They experienced Him firsthand doing and saying and being these things. So my question for us this year at Christmas is it possible to experience this Jesus today? Can we know Him personally? Think about it for a moment. If all that I read is true, all that I just read, He's the greatest being of all time. There will never be His equal. There's no comparison to Him. The greatest goal of every person should be to experience Him personally to know Him. Here are some things Jesus has revealed as, as we read those Scriptures. Just contemplate on these things for a moment. He is the Creator of the universe. When we celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ, we're celebrating the Creator of the universe coming to the world to love us. That's just crazy. He's the sustainer of the universe. The Bible says He holds all things together by the Word of His power. He holds the universe together. He is a bigger than big God. There is just nothing bigger than He is. 
He possesses all wisdom and knowledge. I think PowerPoint, you've got to catch up with me here. Is, there, is that coming? or? Oh, there we go. He possesses all wisdom and knowledge. Anything you want to know, He knows. Anything you want to understand, He understands. He is the only uncreated One. Everything else you ever encounter or experience will be something created by Him. But He alone is uncreated. He is the everlasting God. He will never grow weary. He will never faint. He is always there. He is the light of the world. He is the giver of life. The very source of all life that exists comes from Him. The God who created heaven and earth. The God who created you and me. The God who knew you before time began. Imagine that. Of all the complexities of the world, of all the billions of people that have lived and that live today, He knew each and every one before time began. That's incredible. How could He possibly know? The One who knows everything about you even the hairs, or maybe the lack of hair, in my case. I'm thinking, couldn't you have just kept counting? A little higher? My dad has more hair than me. <sighs> the one day that he got distracted and had to do something else was the day he was counting my hair. The one who gave us our unique fingerprints our unique DNA that makes us who we are. This God, this Jesus, this wisdom, this power, this authority, this source of all life, this incredible fountain of wisdom and knowledge and understanding puts Himself in eight or nine pounds of human flesh and comes to earth and cries, feed me, change my diaper, help me sit up, hold me, I'm cold. Can you imagine that? Somebody said Jesus never cried, but I don't think that's true. I think He cried with the best of them. He was a baby. How else do they communicate? Mom! <laughs> this God was born in a stable. He played as a boy. He grew to be a man and lived a perfect, mistake-free life. I mean, who never makes a mistake? I always felt sorry for Jesus' younger brothers. Can't you be more like your older brother? Well, he never did that when he was in school. Well, when he went to the tabernacle. Could you imagine growing up in the shadow of Jesus? One of the greatest miracles in the Bible is that Jesus' brothers followed him and became believers as adults. Don't you think? I think that's an incredible miracle. This Jesus, perfect, mistake-free life, takes our sins on a cross, dies in our place, rises again from the dead, ascends into heaven, sits at God's right hand forevermore with a crown of glory to defend us and to speak for us. Stop and think about that for a moment. The One who created the universe, the fullness of God, fills Him. And He puts out His arm on a cross because He loves you. And He goes to hell and He defeats hell and He rises from the dead and He goes to heaven and He gets His crown of glory. And He sits down at God's right hand. And what does He do? He starts arguing in your defense. And you make another mistake and He says, yes, but. And you do something else wrong and He says, yes, but. And you have the wrong motives and you say the wrong things and He says, yes, but. And he argues on your behalf when I mean, you don't deserve it. When I don't deserve it. Who is this person? Who does that? This is the Jesus we're talking about. Lord of all lords, name above all names, creator, sustainer, savior, and friend. Have you ever had a friend that you were just really proud of that you knew this person? Well, I know so-and-so. Well, I know so-and-so, and his brother plays on blah, 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 hockey team. Well, I grew up, and I used to go to school with so-and-so. 
it's kind of our claim to fame, right? That, that we at least know someone who knows someone who knows so-and-so. Isn't that right? Austin's claim to fame is that he went to the bathroom in a hotel in California and just about knocked over Justin Bieber because he's short and he didn't see him. <laughs> Bump! <laughs> We always talk about the people that we meet or that we know who are somehow great in our eyes. But Jesus is my friend. He's going to stand up for me when I'm wrong and I don't deserve it. When I've failed again. Wow. And we just ought to say wow for the whole Christmas season. We just ought to walk around going wow. It was so cool. I was in my credit union the other day, and, and there was Jesus over on the counter. In a nativity scene, I thought, wow, the Savior, the universe is just right there on the filing cabinet. We should just, things should amaze us, shouldn't they? You should put on a Christmas album, and you should just be going, wow, wow, wow. How could you possibly get bored? of hearing about this Jesus. If you are, something's wrong. If you are, you haven't experienced Him. If you are, you need to know Him personally because He will never bore you. If the simplicity and the power of the Gospel doesn't fire you up, then something's wrong. And you need to press on to experience Him. I've been a teenage boy in church and I've been bored. It's true. I've been there. I've sat in the services fighting to stay awake so my dad and mom wouldn't get upset with me. Fighting to sit still and not be distracted. We didn't have smartphones then so I couldn't sit like this and flip through Facebook, you know. We had to listen. I remember those days being bored. I remember hitting about 16 or 17 years old and wondering what all the hoopla was about. Anyone kind of relate to that? What is all the hoopla about? You know, what's what's the deal? <sighs> I have to go to church every Sunday. <sighs> I remember thinking, you know, I'm not going to be a Christian because my mom and dad are. Because that's stupid. And that's true. It is stupid to be a Christian because your parents are or because your friends are. That's dumb. And I remember thinking that, you know, what if... What if I grew up on the other side of the world and we practiced some funny jungle religion? Would I be convinced that that was the truth? What if I grew up in Asia and we practiced some Eastern religion? Would I be convinced that that is the truth? Am I just a Christian because I grew up in Canada and my mom and dad took me to church? Is that why I'm a Christian? And that wasn't good enough for me. And I couldn't be a Christian because my dad is. I could see his life. I could see the sincerity that he lives with. My dad was a wonderful example. My dad never set a bad example for me. But I couldn't be a Christian because he told me that was the right thing to do. Because that's not a good reason. I had to experience Jesus personally. I had to know for myself. And so I began to pray around 17 or 18 years old and say, God, if you're really there, I want to know you personally. I don't want to be a Christian because my dad told me I should believe the Bible, because my mom and dad are good people. That's great, but I need to know if you're out there. Are you out there? And I prayed that for about six months. And I have to say that over that time in my teenage years, my heart had grown cold to who Jesus is. And that can happen to us. It can happen to anyone. We can just grow cold. We get distracted by things around us, the experience of the world, the friends, the, all the other things that are going on, our goals, our dreams, blah, blah, blah. We just be distracted. And my heart had really grown cold to God. And without realizing it, my heart had kind of become this cold, hard lump of stone. <laughs> it's just hard. But I wanted to know the truth. And I began to pray, and I was kind of at the point where I was about to leave home. And I knew that I'd be starting to make some big decisions in my life. And I really didn't want to start making those decisions until I knew for certain. 
And so I pray, God, are you there? Are you real? Can you speak to me? Can I know you? Can I feel your presence? Can I experience you personally? And I honestly prayed that for about six months and didn't feel a thing. Went to church every Sunday cold as a rock. <laughs> Just kind of going through the motions. My youth leader at the time took me aside one day and said, you know, Mark, I've kind of been watching you in church and it seems like you don't really know God. It seems like you're kind of just going through the motions and you're here, but you don't really know him. And I cried. I said, you're right. I don't know if I know him. I don't know. And so I searched. And I would pray Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart. O oh God, renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Renew in me a right spirit, God. God, can I know you? Are you there? God, is it just my heart that's hard or is, is, is it all a lie? Are you real? I'll never forget the night walking along. Cold night, about 11 o'clock at night. Clear sky. Maybe the first or second snow of winter. And the stars were out unbelievably. I was up on a mountain road in Christian Valley. Good place to be if you want to find Jesus, right? Go to Christian Valley. So there I was in Christian Valley just walking along. I prayed that prayer again. And I really needed to know. I said, God, I'm not going to go pretend I'm a Christian for the rest of my life. Either you're real or you're not. I'll never forget walking along, looking up at the stars and wondering again. Just seeing the expanse of the cosmos. The Milky Way was unbelievable that night. There's no light pollution there. And suddenly, this presence filled me an incredible divine presence just consumed my body and I felt the incredible love of God the incredible grace of God the incredible presence of God and he began to speak to me in my heart I began to hear his voice for the first time maybe in years man I just started to cry I was just having this experience with the creator of the universe who filled me, who just completely consumed me. And I knew that I would never doubt. I had experienced him. There's nothing we could be about or live for that can accomplish more than the simple message of Jesus. Just knowing him. You can experience him personally. I challenge you. Seek Him. Open your heart. Maybe it'll take a day or a week or six months or six years. But seek Him. Experience Him personally. I've had many more experiences since that day. I don't walk around with my head in the clouds and go, oh, I feel Jesus. I, just, I don't live that way. But from time to time, this presence of God consumes me in a way that's overwhelming. I remember days standing here on this piano and, and I'd be playing the piano and suddenly the presence of God would be so strong that I'd be like, I don't think I can even stand and play. Just experiencing His love and His grace. Experiencing, seeing, comprehending. Revelation is so much better than head knowledge. I knew all about Jesus up until that day. I could argue with you for hours about doctrine. I could argue with you for hours about creation versus evolution or whether there was a God or wasn't a God. I had every argument in the book that I knew. But when I experienced Him personally, that changed me. You can hear about Jesus. You can know about Him. You can know all about the Gospel in your head. But if you never really know Him, if you never really experience Him firsthand, you don't really know. When you experience Jesus, it gets in your heart and it becomes part of you and it changes who you are. I think about Saul. Now Saul didn't live in a vacuum while Jesus was alive. I don't know if anyone else thinks about that or is it just me? Saul did not live in a vacuum. He didn't just suddenly appear after Jesus died and go, I don't think I like Jesus. Have you ever thought about that? Saul was well-educated, well-rounded, well-involved, well-established as a religious leader. He had a Saul, his name was Saul at the time, he had enough credibility that they gave him soldiers to go after Christians. They knew who he was. He knew who they were. 
He was well informed about Jesus. He knew all the Scriptures. He knew every prophecy that had been written about Jesus. He'd studied them all. Saul knew all about Jesus and he didn't like him. Isn't that incredible? It's possible to know all about Jesus and not like Him. Why? Because Paul never experienced Him. In fact, Saul did not like Jesus so much that he went around persecuting anyone who followed Him. You're going to follow Jesus? I'm going to take off your head. You're going to follow Jesus? I'm going to stone you. You're going to follow Jesus? I'm going to throw your family in prison. You're going to follow Jesus? I'm going to take away your business and destroy it. You're going to follow Jesus? I'm going to burn down your house. I mean, the guy was after the followers of Jesus. He did not like Him. He made trouble for anyone who claimed this newfound faith in Christ. And yet, Paul knew well who Jesus was and he knew all the Old Testament Scriptures. He had all the head knowledge. He knew all about Jesus, but he didn't know Him personally. I want to say this. It's really dangerous to know all about Jesus and not know Him personally. That's a dangerous thing. People with the knowledge of God without an encounter with God can be dangerous. They can be legalistic, negative, critical, overbearing, judgmental. But when you encounter this person, Jesus Christ, everything changes. And that was Saul. One day he's on his way to Damascus to round up more crazy followers of this crazy guy. And he meets Jesus face to face. He experienced Jesus firsthand. And his life was forever changed. He went from being the biggest persecutor to the biggest pusher. He's still pushing people today towards Christ. Everyone needs to know this Jesus. Suddenly Paul changes from from being so antagonistic and so angry and so vengeful and so hateful to anyone who would utter Jesus' name. He changes from that and suddenly everybody needs to know this Jesus. He wrote those elegant words that we read earlier from Colossians. Incredible, elegantly written words about who Jesus is. Just like laughing. It sounds terrible until you try it. And suddenly it's pretty good. Until you experience Jesus personally, you don't really know. Think about Peter, James, and John. They were just fishermen. Kind of rough, a little bit crude, a little bit on the outside of society. They saw Jesus and their lives were changed. They were on the mountain when Jesus was transformed, face radiant, glowing light, clothes glowing bright. They experienced the powerful Creator and Sustainer, the light of the world right there on the mountain in front of them. Think about Thomas. He put his hands in the holes, or his fingers in the holes in Jesus' hands and his hands in Jesus' side. We call him Doubting Thomas, but let me tell you, he was faithful Thomas. He did incredible things. We don't read about it in the Bible. We don't hear a lot about Thomas in the scriptural record, but we know from history that Thomas led a mission expedition to India. He went further with the gospel than anyone else in his day. And when I went to India, I saw the churches that Thomas established still there today. Faithful Thomas. Why? Because Jesus changed him. When he experienced him personally, he becomes a believer. And suddenly he becomes powerful, a force to be reckoned with. John, the the disciple John who followed Jesus as a teenager, who saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain later as an old man sees Jesus on the Isle of Patmos. Hair as white as wool, eyes of fire, two-edged sword in his mouth. Fierce, powerful, and loving. What a vision. Simeon and Anna saw him. Part of the Christmas story that we celebrate at this time of year. They waited long into their old age. They both should have died years earlier, but God had promised them that they would see the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and they waited until they saw the Savior of the world. Think about John the Baptist. 
Jesus' older cousin. How many of you had an older cousin? Beat you up, push you around, you know, always live under their thumb. Well, it was different with John the Baptist because the Bible says before John the Baptist was born, he experienced Jesus. Isn't that right? Because Mary goes to see Elizabeth and John the Baptist is six months in her womb and he leaps in her womb when Mary comes. Prenatal experience. I mean, think about that for a minute. Wow! He had a prenatal revelation of the Christ. Later, John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He knew it from a baby. He experienced Jesus personally. A lot of people think that Jesus was just a kind man with long hair and a long beard. Kind of a prehistoric hipster going around doing good deeds, eh? See a couple tats on there, some skinny jeans, long beard kind to women and marginalized people. That's what people think of Jesus. A lot of people think He was just a good teacher who wore a white robe and had some kind of New Agey ideas about peace and harmony. Some people say He was a prophet. He could tell you secrets about yourself that no one else knew. And He could do a few miracles. But he wasn't just flesh and blood. He was God and he was man. God in the flesh. God come to love us, to save us. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. The fullness of grace. The fullness of love the fullness of glory, the fullness of His power, the fullness of His mercy, the fullness of all knowledge and understanding, the fullness of God in human flesh. That's Jesus. This Jesus is still alive and well today. I can tell you because not only did I hear about Him and think that it was a good idea, I experienced him. I know him personally. People say, how do you know Jesus is real? How do, you, how do you know that you can trust the Bible? I've experienced it. It's in my heart. This Christmas, you can give and receive gifts. You can spend time with family and friends. Those are good things to do. You can share some great experiences. You can eat Auntie Bernice's Christmas cake. Yeah. If you're lucky, you get to eat my turkey. You can open gifts around a tree and love your family. You can experience all of these things. But you can also experience the one who started it all. Jesus. God in flesh appearing. Pure love personified. Forgiveness. Redemption for your soul. The fullness of God in a stable. In a manger. The fullness of God on a cross bearing our sin. The fullness of God crying out, it is finished. The fullness of God resurrected and alive. All the fullness of God crowned forever in glory. He came to a stable 2,000 years ago. He walked among us. He revealed God to us. And He still comes today. You can still experience Him today. He said, if you seek Me with all your heart, you'll find Me. He says, if you draw close to Me, I'll draw close to you. He says, I became sin so that you could be right with God. So that what used to block you, what used to separate you 
from knowing God personally no longer is in the way and you can simply be in the presence of God but could never be done can now be done. He says, I'll make you right with God. You know, how often is our Christianity about the things we don't do rather than what we get to do, which is incredible. Seek Him this Christmas. Amen. Seek Him today. Get to know Him personally. Experience Jesus for yourself and you'll never be the same.